Well, hey everyone, Hudson Henry here, and I'm joined by my good friend, Andy Atkins. Uh, and in this approach in the scene, we're gonna talk a lot about the video capability of the Nikon Z6. It's called Z. So I won't yeah. say Z anymore. Yeah, Z, okay. Z. And uh, Andy's an amazing filmmaker, an Emmy award-winning filmmaker. Uh, and he's done a lot of work editing, producing, directing, shooting, and worked with tons of different cameras. So he's gonna take a look at that. Um, I'm going to just really quickly jump in and talk just a bit about my impressions as a primarily uh, a, a stills photographer. I'm going to show you some images and talk about what I really like about this camera and some little quirks that it has. I know Andy has some little quirks that he has found with it as For well. Video, yeah. um, but, uh, you know, I have a longer format video I'm putting out this week as well called my rants and raves about the Nikon Z cameras. And it, it goes way into depth. If you want to know more, you know, I've got a whole list of pros, cons, uh, more pros than cons. That's why I'm calling it raves <laughs> and rants. Good. Yeah, that's good. Uh, and if you come on, Nikon, change this in firmware. This is just silly mm -hmm. comments. So uh, I want to just uh, talk about the image quality first and foremost and stills. When we were going out testing this thing, we went out in, at night in Portland. And that's where I started really noticing just how capable it is in low light. Uh, and, and I took these photographs of Andy up on a downtown rooftop here in Portland and you know at 4000 ISO with no you know extra noise reduction applied just the standard in Lightroom as it comes in there's almost no visible noise in this image and, and boosting it up to 18000 ISO getting a brighter frame still you know there's a little bit of noise but it's it's really really minimal and if we take a look you know zoomed in here you can see I've done a little bit of develop settings uh, it's just almost perfectly clean at 4000 ISO and the noise is really acceptable and could easily be cleaned up in post-production at 18,000. You know, and then running around with the kids and, and the pets at home photographing with this in auto ISO, I was just blown away. This is 22,800 ISO. You know, one of the reasons why I wanted this particular camera was to be able to use it in low light conditions. It's a lower megapixel count than my D850. That's why I got the Z6. That and the fact that it's supposed to have a little bit better output to video. We'll talk more about video with Andy. Um, but I found that it's, it's low light video and it's video quality for me as a Nikon shooter is better than anything that I've had. And the still images at low light are just incredible. Uh, and you know, if you check out my, my raves and rants, you'll see that there's, there's some time lapse capabilities it has that are just amazing too. And when I compared it, uh, same setting, same lens through its FTZ adapter with my Nikon D850, the D850s, uh, this is in the same profile, same exact settings, just pulling the shadows a little bit up, doing nothing else in, in Lightroom at the base ISO long exposure. Um, you can see that the obviously the 850 has a little more resolution. It's zoomed in a little bit more with that same lens, but it's got a, kind of a green cast that I would need to correct. The shadows are relatively blocked out, even though pulling them up a little bit. And I feel like the shadows are a little bit more open. Color science is maybe a little bit better in the in the Z6. I really like the image quality. I think that it's got just as much dynamic range, uh, and it, the images just look wonderful out of it. The raw files. Um, the, the last thing that I would uh, talk about is really quickly, it's autofocus. It's been a real issue of controversy. The autofocus tracking, it doesn't have the 3D group autofocus that a lot of the wildlife and sports photographers really, really like. Um, and I've had kind of an interesting finding with it. I, I, I find that it actually catches a subject and tracks it pretty well. And if you time it, that first shot works really well. I tend to like to test children on swing sets coming right at me. This is my cousin. Uh, and, and, you know, as they come at you and go away, it's a real test of the, the tracking autofocus system on a DSLR. And, you know, my Nikon DSLRs, the D5, the D500, the D850 do an amazing job. You know, you'll get 10 out of 10 photos shooting 10 frames a second that are razor sharp and in focus as they move through the scene. The mirrorless cameras that I've worked with so far don't tend to do as good a job with those kind of complex tracking jobs. And... The Z6 is no different. It, it seems to, to do a good job tracking and get a good first shot off, but then somewhere in between shooting and taking the next shot, it loses the focus. Uh, and you'll wind up with kind of a crapshoot as to which images are in focus in a burst. So maybe an, a camera you're going to take off the table if your primary goal is sports and wildlife and you only want one camera. I think, you know, for me, this is a video camera, a time lapse camera, a low light machine. 
and I'm going to keep my DSLRs for sports action and wildlife. Um, but you know, again, if you time it, you know, I've got some shots of my boy Pike where, you know, just being really careful, it'll track just fine. It'll keep with that motion. And if you fire off a single frame, even in low light conditions, it does a pretty good job tracking. It's just, you're not going to get the next shot straight. And the last thing I'll say quick before I really just sort of hand off to Andy here is that this, uh, this 24 to 70 F4 kit lens that comes with it is, is a real little marvel. It's just razor sharp edge to edge, even wide open. This is F4. Um, in, in low light conditions, wide open, just, you know, really, really nice and sharp right on the edge of the frame, as you can see here. So with that said, I want to talk to Andy a little bit about the video capabilities because, I mean, you're traditionally a Nikon shooter. I know you were really, as far as still goes, not so much with your video work. Right. And I think there's a story behind that and a reason why you're curious. Yeah, so I, I when I was younger, like, I mean, basically almost a kid, I, you know, Nikons were my first cameras. And so I started collecting Nikon lenses, which I almost all of which I still have. Um, and I've adapted them to um, sort of my current DSLR mirrorless. Sorry, I'm going to probably call it a DSLR forever, but uh, I realize uh, we're talking about mirrorless cameras now. So this is a GH5, a Panasonic GH5 which is kind of been my go-to mirrorless small camera for even professional use for, uh, you know, since it came out, since I bought it uh, a year or so ago. Um, I think you think of anything that's smaller than a, than a Sony FS camera that, as like a DSLR. That's right, right? that's right, right. I'm just going to group those all yeah. kind of the same category. It's not um, a RED. <laughs> right, it's not a RED. It's not a big giant Sony or Canon or something. Yeah. Um, Anyway, this is a great little camera, and I've been able to adapt, and I've had the GH4 and the GH3 before it, um, and they, they, they're they micro four-thirds, so they're not full frame, they're not even, they're not even super 35, or uh, what is APS-C, the mm -hmm. crop, so that it's a, right. it's a relatively small sensor. They're half the size of full frame. Half the size of full frame, so you mm -hmm. sort of have to do the uh, calculation of doubling your focal length. Yep. Um, and but but you can adapt really easily to great old Nikon glass that and like I said some of these lenses I've had forever since I since I only owned Nikon cameras when I was just shooting more stills and not doing nearly as much video. Now that I'm doing almost exclusively video, at least professionally, uh, I've gravi gravitated towards this kind of camera, um, and that's just because a combination of factors. It just tends to do video really 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 well and. Um, but being sort of coming from Nikon, I've always kind of kept my eye on what Nikon's doing with video. I would love to be able to buy uh, a Nikon camera uh, that did amazing video, and I could just call it good at that, and not and and because I it, it would presumably shoot great stills too. I haven't found that yet. I guess the question to me was, would would this camera do it? Would this camera fit that bill? And the short answer is not. Not exactly. Um, it definitely has, I think, a place in in a toolkit of somebody like me, um, and I think that place is really for low light. Like Hudson said, it's a low light machine. Uh, it shoots low light quite a bit better than the GH5. The GH5 is not great though, so it's not um, in low light. It's it, it, that's the a, a big weakness of of this line of cameras actually is it's not sort of been. Um, anywhere near the cutting edge in terms of low light or dynamic range. Um, this, the, the Z6 is definitely a step above in terms of low light. I don't think it is in terms of dynamic range and video. I noticed that pretty, pretty quickly. Um, but it's, but it's, you know, it's pretty great. It's a Nikon, number one. And, um, you know, there was a reason I started all those years ago shooting on Nikon cameras. They just make good cameras. Um, it gives you access to all this wonderful Nikon glass that, they've been making for, Ever. I don't know, forever. Um, and it's, I found it's a pretty usable camera. I like where everything's kind of located. Uh, I'm sure if I spent weeks with it, I would find little things to nitpick about like why I have to dive into a menu to change this certain setting, but nothing jumped out at me as like a real deal, deal breaker in terms of kind of the layout of it or the feel of it. It feels quite a bit like this, which is what I'm used to. I mean, there's things I don't like about this either, don't get me wrong. <laughs> about you know um having to do certain things in menus and stuff but in general it's pretty good and better than most uh definitely i have issues whenever i jump on a, a small sony mirrorless camera for instance it seems like there's a lot more things you have to dive into a menu to switch um and the buttons are uh, one of my complaints with sony is the buttons get a little cramped and mm -hmm. i wind up accidentally 
changing settings I don't mean to just by resting my thumb somewhere. Right. And I feel like Nikon's been really good with ergonomics engineering and that's continued into this camera. It's comfortable in the hand. The controls are where they belong and I don't seem to be bumping anything accidentally. So Right. It does feel like they, you know, in shooting video, it does feel like they sort of designed it a little more with the video shooter in mind, mm -hmm. um, which is nice. Um, so so that's that's all good stuff. Yeah, it's a solid camera, pretty, pretty usable. It's got... Um, it's got a HDMI output that outputs uh, a higher bit depth and a 422 image. You can look that up. It just basically means it's it's not anywhere near like raw, like you would be used to shooting if you're a still shooter, but it's closer to that. Mm -hmm. It's basically just more information coming out than a, than um, is than you would actually record internally. Gives you um, a little more dynamic range and more ability to 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 regain highlight and shadow detail and color detail when you're in post production. Yes, now there's a little nuance to that that that's because the only way to get the, a new um, log shooting mode is through that HDMI out. So you can't do that internally. There's a um, Nikon came up with its own log um, basically uh, gamma cur gamma profile that it, it it uses in this camera, but only through the HDMI out, as mm -hmm. far as I know, right? Mm -hmm. You can't do that internally. I'm not totally sure why, right. but anyway, you can do it. You just have to go out the HDMI and record into something else like like this. That's like a, a little HDMI recorder. So it's an additional expense, and they right. um, there's a variety of them out there. It gives you that possibility at least, which is really nice, um, and and it. I, I actually would feel pretty comfortable using that in a in a pretty high end professional environment. Like, say, we were going to go out and shoot something at night, like here, like we've got here. Um, there is a, I think, a pretty good difference between what record, it records internally and what it records to uh, ex externally out the HDMI with the uh, analog settings. So, watch the switch here. Yeah. yeah, so you kind of have to pixel peep a little bit to see the difference, but there's a difference here. Mm -hmm. The um, at 6400, this was a, a little bit of an ISO test and a little bit of an analog versus non-analog test. So play those back again. Starting yeah, let's with the play GH5. for the GH5. Yeah, and you'll see the GH5 is just noisier. There's no mm -hmm. doubt about it. Um, but there's even though it's noisier, if you look at some of the sh in the shadows, there it's cleaner than this. Right. Um, you'll see some issues if you really look closely at some of the shadows in the bridge there. Mm. Those issues, for the most part, go away when you use analog and are, and are recording externally. So that's nice. You have that mm. flexibility. The downside is you have to do that externally. You can't do it internally. Yeah. Um, so you're not able to totally take advantage of some of the great, uh, uh, great new things about this camera without the external package here, the external recorder. Yeah, and they're not super cheap. No, they're not, they're not, they're not super cheap. Hudson's right. Um, if you're, you know, and you want to probably get a decent one that records mm -hmm. it um, to ProRes or something. There's probably inexpensive ones. I happen to already have one. So like for me, if I was, if I wanted to, you know, get this camera or borrow Hudson's and go shoot something at night, I, I, I don't have that additional expense. So it's not a big deal for me, but if you don't have one already, it's obviously an expense. Yep. Um, Sort of along those same lines, the XQD cards that it shoots to are great, but they're, if you don't have them already, again, it's another expense. There's only one slot in here, and it's only XQD. Um, that's so one, that's one of my rants. I think it would have been nice to add an SD slot. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, they're, it's a great, um, you know, these are great cards. They're, they're, I think they're, they're built better, they're more durable, they're faster than SD cards. Mm -hmm. However, for just video, if we're talking just video, you're internally, it's not recording at a really high bit rate. Um, we've done the math and it's like somewhere around 120 megabits, which is okay for 4K video. It's not mm -hmm. great, it's okay. Um, these cards will write a lot faster than that and you're not taking advantage of that speed when you're using the video, uh, internal video recording. They'll um, write nearly four times that speed. Yeah, and I right. think that the, what Canon is doing is harnessing it for a faster sustained burst rate. Nikon, um, what Nikon? I mean doing. Nikon, yeah. yeah the faster sustained burst rate. And yes. It, it doesn't need as big a cache. They can make everything a little smaller, and they're using the card to offload that. Cache yeah, I faster. totally get why they yeah. why they went with this. I mean, it is faster. It's just that you're not for video. You're not utilizing that ex yep. all that extra speed that you're paying for. So that's just a little kind of mm -hmm. could go either way. Um, 
The uh, so n log is n log is great, but again, it's sort of a mixed blessing because you gotta gotta use this. That's where you get the good dynamic range. I, I you know I, I can't say anything super quantitative about this, but you definitely have less dynamic range shooting in video if you don't use n log. Mm -hmm. um, not by a ton, but definitely by some. There's another there's another test in here where we put it up next to the GH5, and I found that n log on the Z6 versus V-Log, which is Panasonic's flavor of, of, of a log gamma curve, um, is about the same. I mean, you have, it's, these dynamic range is a hard thing to test mm -hmm. objectively, but to my eyes, it was about the same. I, we could probably roll that clip here. Which one was it? It was oh. the DR test. Um, oh, this one. This yeah. one, yeah. So here's the GH5 and V-Log. So look at the... It, it's sort of calibrated by the peak of the roof there, where there's just a little bit of... Um, this is the studio where we're sitting. Yeah, yeah. This is the exterior of our building. And so look, the, the, the shadows, you're, you're able to see under the roof line there about the same amount of shadow and about the same amount of highlight in both of these. We can go back and do it again. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the take home of this was, you know, it's not a super scientific test, but to me, looks about the same. It's not a huge, there's not a huge difference in dynamic range between these two cameras. But again, remember that this is shoot, this is being recorded externally on the Nikon. Right. Um, you have to record it externally over the HDMI out port with the Z6 and the GH5 is doing this internally. Right. Um, big difference. Big, yeah, big, it's a big difference. Yeah. Um, and, and you get less dynamic range if you don't use analog, to, just to reiterate that, you get less dynamic range on this. And, and for those of you who the log thing is seeming a little bit confusing, I mean, it really is just a kind of a profile setting that's attached to this video. And if you're gonna be using it, it means you're gonna need to do some work in post-production to right. get that video looking nice. It winds up being kind of, kind of flat, a lot like a raw file that needs to be edited a bit to look nice. You know, right. It's not going to have that, that, that contrast, that pop, that color right. saturation. So. It's meant to be correct. In fact, it's meant to have a LUT applied to it like right out of the gate. Now, an interesting little wrinkle is that for some reason Nikon came out with N-Log, but as of at least a few days ago when we checked, they didn't release a LUT with it, which is a little bit curious because... I'm sure they will. I'm, I'm sure yeah. they will. Um, it's just a kind, of, it's kind of strange that they haven't yet. Poor because timing. Yeah. yeah, because it seems like they would need it to, they would be using that LUT to engineer N-Log. But anyway, different. Um, so keep, keep, keep your eyes out for that. We hope that that shows up. Because yeah. that just makes it easier. Otherwise, you're kind of guessing as to what, what, how you're supposed to correct it. And you're yeah. just using your eyes, which, which ends up working. It's just not ideal and it's yeah. slower. Um, so obviously, this is full frame too, which is pretty, pretty sweet. Um, you get that nice shallow depth of field, which I'm sure you all love. Um, it can be a little bit of a mixed blessing for video. I've edited plenty of stuff that's shot on full frame um, cameras with from shooters who, you know, it's hard, and especially in documentaries and stuff, it's hard to nail focus, and it gets that much harder when you've got a full frame camera with really shallow depth of field. When you get it, when you do get your focus right, it looks great, mm -hmm. but I've had to, you know, throw a lot of stuff out that's out of focus or where the focus is kind of hunting around and doesn't quite nail it because Again, it's just harder to get with that full frame camera. So watch out for that. Um, well, and most of you professional shooters manually focus for that reason. Right. The autofocus tends to be slightly off or hunts and right. seeks, and that looks terrible in video when it's coming in and yeah. out. Yeah. Now, it does seem like there's some possibilities here with this camera. It, it does seem encouraging that the autofocus in video seemed to be pretty good. I know you've probably actually maybe tested that more than me. I have. I've done videos like we're doing right now with a shallow depth of field, and, and just it, it recognizes face. Mm -hmm. It'll automatically recognize a face, and so I just walk in front of the camera, whoop, it locks focus on me, and it does a really nice job keeping me in focus with a beautiful blurred background, uh, and that's pretty cool. Yeah, you know? so I could see if you got used to that and sort of figured out the little quirks and idiosyncrasies of the autofocus, mm -hmm. you could probably take advantage of it and, and, and do some pretty cool stuff. Well, um, it has the ability to rack focus, too, especially yeah, if you have nice. faces. Yeah. You could touch a face, and it'll slowly shift the focus yeah. from one to the other, and you can control how quickly it does that. So there's yeah. some pretty neat potentials that were, and I think that's only going to get better mm -hmm. and better mm -hmm. and better as this focusing on the sensor technology takes off. Yeah. Um, so yeah, autofocus I think is a, is a good thing for this camera. Um, 
it's uh, in video. In, in in video, yes, right, 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 right. In video, we're talking video here. Yeah. Um, in general, it's something that I don't really, I don't really um, utilize utilize much. No. Um, I guess I'm just saying in this camera, I might, I might try to experiment mm -hmm. with it and see what I could get away with. Mm -hmm. um, so again, low light, it's a killer. Um, yeah, it's. I found that like you know, I can take the. GH5 up to maybe 3200 or 6400, which I which I had here. Um, 6400 would require some additional noise reduction, probably. Um, but 3200 is actually decent, not great, but decent, usable. Um, this goes way way beyond that. Um, I mean, we were shooting stuff up into 22,800. Know, I mean, it was like that was, you know, with, like you start to see a little bit of noise, yeah. but. More you know, so than in this raw stills. Yeah, yeah right, right. Yeah. It still like looks pretty good. So, and especially if you were able to do analog to an external recorder, then all of a sudden you're talking about shooting, you know, in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. um, which opens up a whole new world. Now, low light's an interesting thing. It's, it's um, in if it's truly, truly dark, um, and or say you just don't have a very fast lens available, then you are, you know, this camera would really, really shine. Yep. Um, if it's sort of like dusky and you want it to kind of look dark anyway, and you don't need to boost it up past like say 3200 or something, or you just have a fast lens, like this is a 0.95 lens here, which I love. Um, this actually doesn't do that bad in that type of environment. And, and you, I would think I would still probably get a better image. It's just in those really high ISO. So it's more of like, it's not that low light maybe isn't the right term, it's just high ISO, this really slays um, at least the GH5 in our kind of head-to-head -head test. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think it's it's a pretty awesome camera. A couple of things I think could be better, um, just in terms of specs. Uh, you know, there's the I talked about the bit rate not being that high, and there's no options for like higher bit rates until you go to an external recorder, which is um, then that's going to be dependent on the recorder, uh, the recorder itself. Yeah. Um, it you know. In comparison to the GH5, the GH5 just has like dozens of different kind of shooting modes. Um, it'll do higher frame rates as well. At 4K, it'll go up to 60 frames per second. Um, and this one maxes out at 30. Goes to 30. Um, it's got um, uh, much higher bitrate modes. It's got an all intra codec, which doesn't do doesn't group picture group frames together to do compression. So it's just got more flexibility in terms of shooting formats and shooting modes and recording bit rates and stuff like that. Um, it does do the 10 bit 422 video internally. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't you can go external and and do even um, potentially even higher bit rates, but I haven't really found the need to. The internal codec is so good, although it's kind of uh, a little bit dicey to, to edit with. It's um, you got to have a pretty fast system to edit with it. It's, um, it's like we've traveled two roads to these two different cameras. I mean, I think Panasonic and Lumix have really focused on you, professional yeah. video crowd, and the people that want to move light and fast with a small camera and do really high-end video. Uh, whereas Nikon has traditionally been so focused on stills mm -hmm. and, to a certain extent, time lapse with you know some of the things that they've come out with, and then. You know they're moving towards having a higher quality video product here, but you know I mean there's there's years and years, and this is on the right. fifth iteration of a camera that's really been adopted by mm -hmm. new video shooters, and it's true. Yeah. They've focused their attention on the video crowd, and it's yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, and it's yeah. paid off because mm -hmm. like I, I I've I've sort of been looking for a reason to sell this and, and get something else. Not that I don't like it, it's just like I, you know, I do like Nikon and I'm always kind of keeping my eye out for what else is out there, but I just haven't found anything. You know, the, if you can't live with the Micro Four Thirds, that's that's a big deal, but mm -hmm. I've I've been able to find ways to yep. be fine with that. The, uh, there's, well, this isn't the Metabones adapter, but you get, there's a, there are adapters that sort of, um, can give you more depth of field and let you have a wider field of view um, and actually give you a little more light um, and make basically make your lenses a little faster too. Um, so that's one way to sort of work around the four, micro four thirds thing a bit. I, it's interesting, I've always wondered why Nikon hasn't gone more into video because of all the big camera companies, they're the only ones who don't have like a pro video line that they mm -hmm. would cannibalize. That's mm -hmm. what's never made sense to me is why mm -hmm. they why mm -hmm. they can't mm -hmm. just go more all in on video because Panasonic makes really high end broadcast cameras that right. that 
you know, they don't directly compete, but in some ways they're competing with themselves. Mm. You know, same with Canon, same with Sony. Certainly Sony. Nikon you know. doesn't have any, like, Nikon doesn't have any dedicated video cameras, so it seems like they're in a company, they're a company that's in a better position to actually go yeah. all in on making a really killer video DSLR or mirrorless Without camera. competing with themselves. Without, yeah, they're not going to cannibalize any of their own business. Yeah. I've never understood why they didn't sort of see it that way. Right. Um, I think they're make, they've made r dramatic moves in the last generations of DSLRs mm -hmm. to this mirrorless. I mean, the 810 that I had only did 1080, then the 500 does 4K, yes. but only on the center of the sensor. Then the mm -hmm. 850 does really nice 4K. There's things that could be better about it than this guy does is the first... You know, yeah. first uh, mirrorless full-frame camera to put 422 10-bit uh, yep. video out the HDMI. And that's a big deal. That's like, for somebody like me, you know, it makes it, it makes it actually a pretty usable camera in certain scenarios. Definitely, like I said, if I was going to go out and, and I needed to shoot, shoot something in the wee hours of the night, uh, I, I, would, I would get one of these. I, I would borrow Hudson's first. Actually, I wouldn't go buy one. <laughs> um, but um, that, 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 that. 10-bit 422 output with N-Log is, um, it, it, it lets this kind of be a serious video shooter camera. But for you guys thinking about this in terms of like, if you're not going to buy this, mm -hmm. uh, if you're not going to buy an external recorder, um, the internal codec is fine. It's not, it's not, it's not amazing. I've actually, we can, we've got a clip here or a still here. So this is a little bit of pixel peeping, but you kind of have to pixel peep anymore to find problems with images. Um, so here's the GH5. Uh, this is just shot close by here. It's a real high detail test, which tends to, um, this is kind of what I do if I want to really stress a codec. Um, GH5 is 100%. This is 100%. Yeah. Um, so kind of look at the ferns and the foliage here. And then here is the, um, here is, so again, here's the GH5. Here's the Z6. Mm. Um, oh, yeah. You can see, I'm going to go back and forth a little bit. There's a lot more detail. A lot more detail in the GH5. Um, mm -hmm. This, however, and it just kind of falls apart here in the fern and the grass. And this is at base now, ISO. Uh, correct, right. right. Um, yeah, this is not a high ISO uh, type of deal here. So mm -hmm. the one thing you gotta understand though is that this is coming out of a pan. Mm. Um, so once, so the camera's so making moving. It, yeah, so things have been moving. And remember, these are, uh, it's called a long gop codec, and you're stuck with the long gop codec. A group of pictures gets compressed all at once, so it's looking for differences between frames and mm. capitalizing, the codec is capitalizing on the fact that most things from one frame to the next stay the same. So mm. if they're changing, it's got to work harder and throw more away. Remember that in video world, these images are crazily compressed to the tune of like 90% of the data coming off the chip has to get thrown out in order for it to write at the bit at the sustained bit rates that it needs to. So that's right. If you think JPEG compression is bad, the video yeah. compression is significantly right. Worse. So co coming out of a pan, it sort of breaks down because it's like stuff's been moving around, and it's like this is a real good stress test for a codec. So once it stabilizes after maybe a few more frames or a second or so. There, we got to observe. We got to go back to. Oh, it's significantly better. It's better. It yeah. is better. Uh, whether you notice that or not, definitely not for like um, a video you're probably just going to put on YouTube or share with your friends. If you're making an independent film or a documentary that you want to show on a big screen, on a big screen, somebody might notice this. Um, mm -hmm. It's you know, you could argue that we're splitting hairs and really pixel peeping here, but. Yeah. Um, I'll kind of let you guys be the judge of whether this is a big deal or not. Because remember, we're looking at this um, yeah. way close, right? Right. You're not so, going to notice that on your, on you're your not television set that unless here. you have a television set the size of your wall. Yeah. Right. There are differences. There are some mm -hmm. kind of imperfections in this, but um, you got to look hard to see them. So yeah. overall, internal codec. Pretty good. No, no major, major complaints. It's just a, you, it is, it is a compromised codec, as all our codec, uh, as all our, <laughs> as all. are all codecs. <laughs> um, it's just that you know this is a, a pretty low bitrate codec, and you can tell they've made some compromises somewhere along the line. That's not perfect. Mm -hmm. um, another kind of like another thing I noted. In fact, this was we did a take of this last night that. Um, that ran a little longer, we had to do some starting over or something, and it cuts off at 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, and that's true, I think, of all Nikon cameras still, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, 29 minute, 59 yeah, second Yeah, after that, it, on the clip length. it just stops. It doesn't start another clip. It just stops. Mm -hmm. Like that'd be a little bit of a deal break for, for me that I shoot quite a few interviews. If I took this and shot an interview, I'd be just like stressed out looking at the clock that we're running up against our half hour. And interviews usually go longer than that. A lot of interviews go longer than that. Again, you can do it to the external uh, recorder and have as long as you want, as long as your SSD card doesn't fill up. But that's, again, the other the added expense of that. Right. Um, right. So uh, anyway, that that's maybe the only real kind of deal breaker for me on this um, that would that'd make me not be able to really depend on it for a variety of shooting situations. Um, and the last thing I'll mention um, that I noticed that was a little bit of a negative was that the audio input is a little noisy compared to the GH5, compared to, I, I tested it against um, another nice like dedicated Tascam recorder that I had that's really quiet, really good preamps. And it, there was definitely a noticeable, although not super objectionable, a noticeable hiss in this when I recorded the, from the exact same mics, exact same room, everything you could, uh, on the uh, on the GH5 and the and the Tascam, you could hear basically only kind of the room noise that's in the room. Um, I just did it in here where it's pretty quiet, but not dead quiet. Um, but you could hear additional noise on the Z6. And if you were in like shooting in a studio, a studio environment like a acoustically um, a nice environment where it was real quiet and and dead you'd probably notice that even more. Um, right. You can remove some of that with audio post noise reduction, but um, it's always good to start with the, the cleanest possible audio. And this wasn't, you know, it was, it was only kind of so-so in that department. So. And, and from my perspective, coming from the previous generations of Nikon DSLRs that have incorporated video, it's, it's better from that mm -hmm. perspective. It's got less kind of hiss. It isn't a problem I run into too much doing the kinds of things that I do. Uh, unless I really record something too low and I need to amplify it after the fact. Yeah. And then, then you start amplifying that noise along with it, and that's a real problem with my Nikon D850. I have to kind of get the yeah. levels right before I start. This one, it's a little more forgiving, but obviously not as good as what Andy's used to working with. So. And, and what I, sh I should qualify that by saying, um, I'm talking about the external mic input. Right. Uh, I have no comment yet on the actual like onboard mic. I tend to not use those. Sometimes it's nice to have, you know, you, it's always running, so you have it for maybe kind of ambient sound or mm -hmm. natural sound. If you're if you're shooting something, but um, I'm talking about for like hooking up a wireless mic like what we've got on right now to the thing. That's right. how I tested it and 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 noticed that little bit of noise. So um, well, and that's what I'm talking about. That's too. what Hudson's yeah. talking about too. Right. So um, anyway, that you know, but none of those things, none of those things, other than the 30 minute limit, I would have a hard time working around that. That would that would that would bug me a lot. Um, other than those things, pretty capable. Pretty capable camera. I'm glad Nikon is definitely like making strides, I think, in the right direction for video. I would love to sort of see them take it all the way. I don't think this camera quite takes it all the way. Um, but it's close. But it's close. It gets there. It's, it's mm -hmm. definitely, a, definitely an improvement for, for them. Um, and I look forward to sort of seeing what they... They've got, uh, and I'm sure you and I will be out. You know, Andy's worked with me. Uh, I've worked with Andy on the, the American Ascent film on Denali, and he's worked with me on some of my, uh, you know, mm -hmm. bears my ears out on location mm -hmm. video work. He helped me with my core photography course and uh, and producing that. And you know, we'll be out in situations where it's really low light and we want to film. And I would um, almost rest assured that, that we would be reaching I'll for be that. I'll be shooting camera. on this every now yeah. and then. Yeah, so we'll, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll, check back. we'll check back in <laughs> and, and report on after uh, maybe a few months of more use of it. But as, 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 as of right now, yeah, I, I, I like this camera. Yeah, I, I really like it. Uh, again, it's not my wildlife camera. It's not my sports action camera. It's not my camera to make the highest resolution prints to put on the biggest walls. But for working in low light mm -hmm. situations, for traveling light, um, and uh, I, I'm really digging it. If, again, if you want to hear some more of my photographer-focused comments on this camera, I've got that rants and rave or raves and rants video mm -hmm. that I put out. I've also got the tips and tricks video for those of you that have it and want to look at how I've got mine set up. Um, those are linked below. And uh, you know, this series, approaching the scene, is all about having a conversation about all things photographic, including the merger, you know, the, the convergence between video, time lapse, still photography, 
And it's pretty amazing that we have these tools that do so many things so well. And I think every generation of them, they get better and better and better. So that's exciting. And if you want to join the conversation, I encourage you to leave comments here on the YouTube channel. You know, send them to questions at HudsonHenry.com. Go check out some of Andy's stuff. I'll, I'll throw a link up to, to some of Andy's real work uh, on, his, uh, on his site. Cool. He's got some really, really nice stuff. Um, you know, he's an amazing filmmaker. So thanks so much for coming in. Hey, yeah, thanks. And, uh, I had to come a long way for this. I you know. know. <laughs> My desk is right over there. Yeah, we do a lot of collaborative work here <laughs> in the studio. So. But, All right, uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.